Half a day students, I am Governor Lou Leon Guerrero. You all have been through a year of big changes. We've had to adapt and make big changes to keep our families and our island safe. But with change comes opportunity and a chance to try new things like PBS University. While Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenori and I will continue to do our part to keep our island safe, you students have a part to play as well. Your part is to keep learning and to keep up with your lessons. That's why I am happy to see you here ready to learn with PBS University. PBS University is a way to bring a continuous educational curriculum to you while you stay safe at home during this time. To help you keep up with your studies, we asked our friends at PBS Guam and the Guam Department of Education to put together this episode. Thank you for doing your part and have a great lesson. It's a hot afternoon and you splash into the waters off Marizo Pier. When you come up for air, you see this white stuff floating on the surface of the water. It's not sea foam or plastic. These are actually small flowers made by seagrasses. Seagrasses are the only flowering plant that can be found in the ocean. Worldwide, seagrasses have been declining about 7% a year. And in Guam, the most recent estimate is a 22% decline over the past decade. So what is happening to our seagrasses and why might that be concerning? On this episode of PBS University, we're going to explore Guam seagrasses, the life within them, how scientists study potential threats to seagrass, and the incredibly valuable services they provide for people and the planet. Throughout this video, we will have some brainstorming challenges. If you are in a classroom or even at home, feel free to get out some paper and pens and find a friend to discuss with. So before we talk about how our seagrasses have changed, what exactly is seagrass? Seagrasses are marine flowering plants, or marine angiosperms, the term for a flowering plant. They evolve from land plants, so they actually have traits similar to many larger land plants and are very different from algae you might find in the ocean. Let's take a closer look. Seagrasses are vascular plants. If you look inside of them, they have a network of tubes that help move around nutrients. You also have a cardiovascular system. Veins and arteries inside your body are basically tubes that move nutrients and fluid around. Seagrasses, like land plants, have roots that help them absorb nutrients. Macroalgae, or seaweeds on the other hand, don't have this network of tubes and simply absorb nutrients directly from the water. Macroalgae may also have something called a holdfast, which looks similar to roots but only serves to help the macroalgae stay attached in the sediment or on a surface. Seagrasses also have a rhizome, which is basically a horizontal underground stem. Other land plants that have a rhizome include ginger and bamboo. This rhizome allows seagrasses to grow horizontally and expand the size of the seagrass bed. This is an example of asexual reproduction. The seagrass is basically making copies of itself along the underground stem. As we mentioned before, seagrasses also have flowers. Similar to land plants, flowers are used for sexual reproduction. For a quick review of how flowers are used in sexual reproduction, let's take a look at this strawberry flower. On this flower are both the male and female reproductive structures. The male structure provides pollen, which gets carried by a pollinator, such as a bee. That pollen is then brought to another flower and fertilizes the egg cell. Eventually, the petals fall off and a fruit with seeds develops. Seagrasses also undergo pollination. Here we have our most common type of seagrass in Guam known as tape grass. This seagrass is different from our strawberry plant. It does not have both female and male structures on the same flower. Instead, there are actually entirely separate female and male plants. The male flowers are released from a structure at the base of the plant and float up to the surface. These male flowers float along until they come into contact with the female flower. Once fertilized, the female flower then starts to turn into a hairy, spiky fruit, which is retracted deeper towards the sediment. 
Eventually, the fruit opens and releases seeds that may float and tumble for a while before selling somewhere and starting growth. Fruits can also float around for about a week, which may help the seeds disperse. Let's review quickly. In the following pictures, can you figure out what is macroalgae and what is seagrass? The most common seagrass in Guam is tapegrass, which has long, wide, tape-like leaves that grow up to about a meter long. Seagrass leaves are also often called blades. Here, you can see some roots that were perhaps exposed during a storm or by an animal. Tapegrass has pretty large roots that can store energy to help the seagrass survive if it needs to tough out a bad time. Like after a major typhoon when the water may be murky or there may be less light reaching the seagrass. There are approximately 72 species of seagrass in the world. In addition to tapegrass, Guam has two more species, spoongrass and needlegrass. These two types are much smaller than tapegrass, and they can grow back faster after a disturbance such as a storm. All three seagrasses are important for wildlife, but tapegrass in particular is a really great habitat. Why do you think that is? What makes a particular underwater location or ecosystem a useful or good habitat? versus a not-so-hospitable habitat. Take a moment to pause the video and brainstorm yourself or discuss with others. Seagrasses are such great habitats because they provide three-dimensional structure. All those seagrass blades provide places for animals to hide and services for organisms to attach to. The seagrass may also provide food to herbivores or help support growth of animals to feed predators. Seagrasses are also often close to mangroves and coral reefs, allowing organisms to easily move between the different habitats and use different food or resources. Tapegrass in particular is very large, which helps provide even more hiding spots, substrate to attach to, and food sources. This sandy area is maybe a less useful habitat for some organisms, because it doesn't have any three-dimensional features for animals to hide in or to attach to. There likely is also less food unless it's hiding in the sand. Some fish that may hide within the seagrasses include juvenile fish, which are newly hatched or smaller, younger fish. Seagrasses are an important nursery habitat for these young fish. Once they get a little larger, they may migrate to the coral reefs. Some animals like rabbitfish or sea urchins may eat the seagrasses. However, many animals such as fish and snails actually feed on the stuff attached to the surface of the seagrass. If you look closely, there's tons of stuff living on the surface of the seagrass. Using a microscope, let's zoom in. The organisms living on the surface of the seagrass are called epiphytes. Epi means on the surface, like the epidermis is the top layer of your skin. Here you can see algae growing on the seagrass. Some of the algae is soft, some stringy, and some make scaly patches. If we illuminate the seagrass from below, we can see lots of microscopic organisms crawling around in the algae. Even this tiny needlegrass blade provides a surface for life to grow on. If you look closely, you can see a little microscopic snail. Here's another shell made from a single-celled organism called a foraminiferin. Many different types of worms also live in the seagrass, or in this case, a piece of decaying seagrass. One of the most common things you can find on the seagrass you can see without a microscope anemones. These anemones are related to corals and jellyfish and use stinging cells to catch things in the water to eat. All these organisms, from the microscopic epiphytes to the larger predators, contribute to the important and diverse biological community supported by seagrass. What do we mean by community? A biological community is the group of the interacting species in a particular area or ecosystem, including the smallest microbes to the largest visitors, like sharks. Now that we have an idea of what lives in the seagrass, take a second to brainstorm and draw a seagrass food chain, or even better, a food web. Here's our base of the food web, in this case, our seagrass. Here are some of the animals you may have included in your food web. 
At the base, seagrass would be supporting the food web in three primary ways. Some animals may eat the seagrass itself. Other animals may be eating organisms on the seagrass. Additionally, pieces of seagrass can break off and decompose. We call this decaying matter from living organisms detritus. Some animals like anemones and sponges may capture or filter out these bits of detritus for food. Some of the detritus may sink to the bottom and feed organisms like sea cucumbers or get buried and stored for a long time. Organisms may then take that energy they absorb from the seagrass and take it to another connected ecosystem or feed larger predators, in this case, a human being who is fishing. Seagrasses support wildlife and fisheries by providing habitats and food, but on a larger scale, they also support water quality. Let's drop in to Coco Sagoon to take a closer look. Standing in Coco Sagoon, looking towards the shore, you may see several habitats. When it rains, the water flows through the terrestrial forest, then through the mangroves, through the seagrass, and finally, it reaches the coral reef. All these types of vegetation are necessary to keep the soil in place and absorb pollution. When wildfires burn through Guam's forests every year, it kills the plants and prevents the forest from growing. When it rains, there aren't roots for plants and trees to hold the soil in place. The sediment flows out to the reef and it can harm our marine life. In this video demonstration, you can see how sediment can negatively impact corals. When the sediment covers the coral, the coral's tentacles retract, which can prevent them from feeding properly, and they may stay closed for some time. The coral also has algae living inside of it that helps it get energy from the sun. With its tentacles retracted, the algae cannot get as much light and produce food. Some evidence also suggests that sedimentation can harm the corals by increasing microbial growth, resulting in stressful low oxygen and low pH conditions. These areas of unvegetated land with exposed soils are called badlands. There are efforts to restore Guam's forests and reduce sedimentation of the coral reefs by planting trees and reducing wildfires. Seagrasses can also help in reducing sedimentation of coral reefs. The seagrass blades create drag in the water, slowing the water down. When the water is calmer, the particles aren't getting churned up and can slowly sink and settle out among the seagrasses. Particles may also collect on the seagrass surfaces by sticking to the mucus produced by seagrass epiphytes. Along the same lines, seagrasses absorb wave energy when they create drag. Here you can see an experiment using artificial seagrass in a wave tank, which is testing how much wave energy is absorbed when the seagrass blades move back and forth. Waves normally break when the shoreline gets too shallow. The top of the seagrass and accumulated sediment in the seagrass spread create large shallow areas farther from the shore, and the seagrasses can act as an earlier break for the waves. In this sunset lighting off the shore in Maritzo, you can even see how the water is smoother and calmer where the seagrasses are. Moving to a different spot, if you've been snorkeling at Petey Bombholes Marine Preserve, you may have snorkeled or walked past the seagrasses. This is probably one of the most popular snorkeling locations, with a noticeable amount of seagrass near shore. But there are also other areas in Guam with seagrass. The red here means very dense seagrass. Orange is a moderate density and the yellow is sparse seagrass. Large and dense areas of seagrass exist around the southern coast, with lots of tape grass, as well as patches of needle grass. There are also some other seagrasses in Pago Bay and some other areas on the eastern and western coast. However, this map you're looking at was created using data from 2005, perhaps before you were even born. Keeping track of the amount of seagrass cover over time is very important to understand how the seagrass ecosystem is doing. Is the seagrass growing, shrinking, staying the same? If there are increases, it could mean many different things. It could indicate that maybe the climate is changing, damaged areas are recovering, or maybe water quality improved. If there's a persistent decline, that can be worrisome since that means there would be less wildlife habitat and coastal protection, and action is needed to prevent further loss. So let's pretend you are a seagrass scientist and you want to measure how much seagrass area there is now. How would you take on this challenge? Take a moment to pause the video and brainstorm yourself or discuss with your fellow students. So you may have come up with some different ways to measure how much seagrass there is. And most likely your method fell into two categories, 
one, on-the-ground measurements, and two, remote sensing from the sky. Remote sensing is basically the process of getting information about an area from afar without physically being there, and can include satellite imagery, sonar used to map the ocean floor, and telescopes used to learn about faraway planets. Seagrasses can be measured using images from satellites or drones. If we know what seagrass looks like from the sky, we can measure the amount of area that matches that particular color, shape, or texture. This is especially helpful for monitoring large areas, since it can be hard to reach every site safely or survey large areas by foot. Here we are zoomed in on Pago Bay and can estimate the size of this area of seagrass by tracing. However, remote sensing can also sometimes be tricky. Here the water is murkier, so it's a bit difficult to tell whether it's seagrass or water with a lot of sediment. Here's another example of seagrass on the east coast. In this image, the seagrass is quite clear. However, the lighting in this satellite image is a little less clear, and it can be hard to identify the seagrass. Also, in this spot in particular, there is more of our smaller seagrass species, which are harder to see from the sky. What about here? This is actually not even seagrass, it's coral. Since habitats such as corals, rocks, seagrass, and algae may look like a similar dark color, remote sensing data needs to be confirmed with on-the-ground measurements. You can verify how accurate your categorization of satellite data was. Scientists can walk around the perimeter of the seagrass bed to measure the area by foot. Another common way scientists characterize habitats is with transects and quadrats. Basically, taking data from inside the quadrat, this square, and set points along this line, which is the transect. Other times, scientists will estimate how much of the quadrat is covered in seagrass using a rough visual estimate. Let's say you're swimming along and you put the quadrat down. Inside, you might mark down 50% of the square is covered in seagrass. Now you try with these photos from Seagrass Watch, a citizen science seagrass monitoring program. What percent seagrass cover do you think there is? Compare your estimate with the person next to you. Did you and the person next to you have different numbers? This method isn't perfect, since people may have different estimates or, at different tides, the seagrass may float up and appear to be more flat and dense. On ground level, you can also get lots of other detailed data. You might record the number of fish or the amount of algae within the seagrass. You might also record the height of the seagrass, the number of blades, or how much seagrass is covered in epiphytes. These observations can help tell you how healthy the seagrass ecosystem is and not simply just the square meters covered in seagrass. In the end, combining both remote sensing and on-the-ground measurements helps provide a more accurate picture with reasonable amounts of effort. So the map we saw first was from 2005, but another study updated the seagrass cover 10 years later, and unfortunately, the researchers estimated seagrass meadows decreased on average by 22% in Guam during that decade. There were some areas where seagrass was lost and some areas where it grew. The reason for this decline isn't clear. What factors affect seagrass cover? Take a pause here to brainstorm some different factors with your fellow students. So here are some factors that may impact the cover of seagrass. Natural climate variation and seasonality, climate change, storms, water quality and pollution, overfishing and dredging are all potential factors. Dredging involves moving sediments under the ocean, often to build structures such as marinas or create channels. In the past, some seagrass areas may have been disturbed due to dredging as our island became more developed. Typhoons can also physically damage seagrasses by ripping them out of the ground or burying them in sediment. Let's hear from a student researcher to learn more about how water quality affects our seagrasses. Hello and half a day, my name is Mary Jubilane Rematira and I am a student studying civil engineering at the University of Guam. I am currently funded by the National Science Foundation, GECO, Ecosystems Collaboratorium for Corals and Oceans, or the EPSCOR program. So my research was about how different water quality factors affect the cover of seagrass located at the south of Guam. The different factors that I have measured for water quality was dissolved oxygen, 
salinity, temperature, and irradiance. I found that sedimentation significantly affects cover and the status of water quality in seagrass bed, especially during heavy rainfall events. Seagrasses are affected by variations in the environment, such as temperature, sunlight, and the tide. Here, the seagrass appears light brown because it was likely was sitting out of the water, exposed to the sun during a very low tide. This sun exposure can expose the seagrass to UV radiation and dry it out. Rainfall can also affect how salty the water is or how many nutrients or pollutants wash into the sea. As climate change alters our weather patterns, changes in our seagrass is likely to occur. Extremely high water temperature can stress out the seagrasses too. So, where there is a lot of nutrient pollution, a lot of algae and epiphytes may grow on the seagrass. This can reduce the amount of sun the seagrasses receives. Since the seagrass is not able to photosynthesize as much, it may not produce as much oxygen, resulting in low oxygen stressful conditions. So overfishing is also involved here because fish can help control epiphyte levels. So by eating epiphytes, large fish population can help prevent seagrass from being overgrown with epiphytic algae. In turn, when there is more healthy seagrass, there is more habitat to support fish. In this way, the seagrass and fish populations are connected and affect one another. Different environmental factors affect the seagrass, but the amount and health of the seagrass itself may also be important. Here's another example. If you have less seagrass and the seagrass is spread farther apart from each other, there will be less pollen and flowers and therefore lower pollination rates. With less sexual reproduction, there might be less seagrass, and that seagrass may not be as genetically healthy. This then can cause even less seagrass, and so on. Our seagrasses may have declined recently, but we need to continue monitoring the seagrass ecosystem to determine if the decline is ongoing or if a rebound occurred. Meanwhile, we can also address known threats, such as reducing climate change, improving water quality, and supporting marine preserves for healthy fish populations. What will be the future of our seagrasses? It will depend on people like you. So I am hoping to work with something related to environmental engineering with a focus on water systems. But I am still exploring more options now and as I go through my undergraduate degree. So up until before I conducted the research, I never knew that these large seagrass meadows existed on Guam. Then I learned that even though they hold this great significance for contributing to our co coastal ecosystems, seagrasses are severely understudied in Guam. So that inspired me as a student and a member of the community to learn more about the systems and share its importance to whoever I can. Seagrass beds forms extensive horizontal rhizomes in an area. Therefore, they are able to support the ecosystem serving as protective habitats and food sources for many fishes and invertebrates. So from a cultural standpoint, by helping sustain our fish population, it keeps our traditional and non-traditional fishing practices alive and well. Also, the endangered green sea turtle or the hagen betty was also seen feeding on seagrass blades. Due to how they are formed, seagrasses act as stabilizers to rough sea conditions as well as buffers to sediments and nutrients, aiding in the survival of our coral reefs. If you are interested to study about the environment and marine biology, don't hesitate to try studying seagrasses. Seagrasses is a complex system and it is conveniently located in shallow areas, so there are endless possibilities to make it a fun learning experience. Seagrass communities sustain biodiversity and are sensitive to water quality changes. That makes them a great indicator of the overall health of our coastal ecosystems. To help protect seagrasses, share your knowledge with others and encourage them to support our marine preserves. When snorkeling and exploring, avoid trampling seagrasses. At home, be a mindful consumer and reduce your plastic and chemical pollution. You can also find opportunities to participate in citizen science or student research and monitoring of seagrasses through local organizations.
For more information, check in with the Department of Agriculture, Bureau of Statistics and Plans, or join the Guam Corps Reef Initiative Facebook page. Hafa Day students, I'm Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio. For more than a year now, you all have continued to wash your hands and watch your distance from others, and you've done a really great job wearing your masks. We know your parents and guardians have helped you to make these changes to keep yourself and your community safe. As Governor Leon Guerrero said, we are happy you are here. We want you to continue to learn and sharpen your skills with the help of PBS University. This program is the result of a collaborative effort. We couldn't do it alone. I'd like to thank the teachers and support staff of the Guam Department of Education and PBS Guam for their work and their commitment to our students. I'd also like to thank you students for participating at home. To your parents, I'd like to thank you for taking an active role in your child's education. We are all eager to return to a time when all of us can share and study together in person. Until then, we hope you learned something new from this PBS University instruction.